WHO European Collaborative Trial of Coronary Heart Disease and the InterCell Study. Number of students and professional colleagues worldwide, the impact Jeffrey Rose had on their lives was profound and permanent. Hopefully that brief summary provides some context for who he was and for the ideas that we will be discussing today. Now, one other piece of context, you've all seen this curve in one form or another. It's commonly referred to as the bell curve or normal distribution curve. A lot of Jeffrey Rose's thinking revolves around this idea as a way of depicting how populations work and how population health can be improved. When you read his work, and, and likely today in the webinar, you'll hear references to the curve being shifted or the tail being truncated or things like that. So if you keep this curve in mind, it will help it all to, to make more sense. Now, in his early writings, he noted that medical practice is largely concerned with treating sick individuals. That a rescue operation of this nature may be entirely appropriate, but it can no more solve the problem of mass diseases than famine relief could solve the problem of hunger in the third world. The radical solution is to identify an impossible remedy the underlying causes of our major health problems. So in today's webinar, we'll explore this thought and discuss some of Dr. Jeffrey Rose's key ideas, including one, the population mean predicts the prevalence of cases. Two, a large number of people exposed to a small risk can contribute more to the total burden of disease in a society than a small number of people exposed to a high risk. Three, the causes of individual cases are not necessarily the same as the causes of disease incidence in the population. Four, the high-risk strategy of prevention and the population strategy of prevention. And five, we'll add some of our own musings about a possible third strategy of prevention that we see. Let's review these in turn and discuss some of their implications, starting with the population mean predicts the prevalence of cases. The one study Dr. Rose did, they analyzed over 50 populations from around the world, and they found a direct and high correlation between the mean or median of each population and their rate of cases. You can see here on the slide this relationship depicted with a number of both biological and behavioral variables, starting from left to right and going from top to bottom. Now there's, uh, you can see in the top left corner, mean systolic blood pressure and the prevalence of hypertension. Right across from it, mean BMI and the prevalence of overweight. Right below that, uh, mean sodium intake and the prevalence of high sodium intake, and then in the bottom left corner, mean alcohol consumption and the prevalence of heavy drink drinking. What these graphs show, you can see the, the R value, that's the correlation value between the mean and the extreme for the prevalence of cases, and B, the slope value, how much it increases. The shape of each of these graphs also shows the relationship between these two figures. So if each of these dots represents a country, what this relationship shows us is that the higher the mean level, let's take BMI as an example. So the higher the mean BMI, the higher the prevalence of overweight in any specific country. And that works across all of these countries that we looked at. So if we go to the other graph, alcohol consumption. The higher the level of average alcohol consumption in a population, the higher the level of heavy drinking as well in that relationship. Now for all of these. These correlations are high, and these R values are high. They range from 0.78 to 0.97, and statistically significant. And these correlations do not imply causation, but they do point out a relationship and a pattern, being that as the mean or average changes, the cases or the extremes change in a corresponding manner. Now, this type of relationship has also been identified between psychiatric morbidity and mean general population mental health scores. Dental caries and the mean dental health score in different communities, household expenditure on gambling and the prevalence of problem gambling, and even math science scores and the prevalence of high achievement and mostly poor achievement in math and science. The implications of this, in my opinion, are gigantic. If this principle is followed in any issue we are concerned about, we are challenged to broaden or sphere of concern from cases and vulnerable populations to include non-cases and the normal population, whatever that may be. Challenges us to think about behaviors and indicators in their normal form, not just their extreme or deviant form. 
We'll come back to implications in a minute and just show a few more things. Here's a analysis Dr. Jeff Rios did as well, identifying the reduction required in a population average in order to reduce by one quarter or 25% the number of people with what would be considered high levels or measurements for each of its original four indicators. You can see on the table the four indicators or variables on the left. You can see the definition of what is considered high. And the column on the right shows how much of a decrease in the average population score would be necessary to decrease the high levels by a quarter. You can see for most of these, the scale of change required in the normal population is much less than 25%. So looking for how do we reduce the problem in the high-risk population. So again, this comes back to relationship between normal mean experiences and prevalence of cases in extreme experience. The importance here, this idea, is that there is a clear and significant relationship between what is considered normal and what is considered a case or deviant. If we ponder this, it serves to reconnect society. Normal people have a direct responsibility for those at high risk or who are vulnerable. There's no longer us and them, there's just an everyone. So for example, if an issue being discussed is problem drinking, based on this idea, one must also include social drinking in one's considerations or whatever will be considered normal alcohol consumption. If the concern was the rising prevalence of certain mental illnesses. One must also include in their considerations the mental well-being of the general population and whatever stressors or causes might be at work there. Because again, the mean predicts the extreme. Again, if affordable housing might be the topic of concern, general trends in housing would have to be considered as well because they're not disconnected. In each of these relationships, there's a connection between the two. So all this does is require us to really do it, to really go upstream in our thinking and think about causation before incidents occurs, to identify general societal trends and connect them with the cases or deviant behavior they produce at their extreme ends. The connection is what is important. Like I said before, there's no longer an us and them. There's just an everyone. Now, the common causes that influence in the same direction both the normal population and the cases may be more subtle as they operate among the normal majority population, but they are nonetheless having an effect, an effect that exerts on both segments of the population. Now, for some, this kind of thinking is reinforcing, even reassuring. For others, it may be threatening and even ludicrous. For example, would you be willing to drink less in order to help reduce problem drinking or to gamble less in order to help problem gamblers? gamblers? or to buy a less expensive house if that helps affordable housing. Your debt ratio and your bank balance may thank you, but your health and their health would as well. If we take this idea seriously, it's huge. I think we could comfortably say that it would change the way we think about public health. Let's turn to the next idea that a large number of people exposed to a small risk can contribute more to the total burden of disease in a society than a small number of people exposed to a high risk. Now, our healthcare system, including our public health system, is largely designed to address the needs of sick individuals. This is appropriate and natural to do so, so that's where the need is. And while this is very appropriate for the individuals affected, it may actually have a minimal impact when we look at the population as a whole and their health status. Let's review a few graphs of examples. This is a graph of diabetes. And there's three things depicted in this graph. If we look at the line, first axis. On the bottom are hemoglobin A1C levels. On the right side is relative risk. On the left side is percentage. If we look at the line first, this shows us the relative risk of mortality. And for those that have known diabetes or a hemoglobin level greater than or equal to 7%, the relative risk of mortality is high. 
which is what we'd expect. When you have diabetes, your risk of mortality has increased. What this line shows us, for those that don't have diabetes, their, their hemoglobin levels are somewhere between 6.9% and even down to close to 5%, there still is a relative risk of morbidity. It's not as high as for those who have diabetes, but there, there is a risk. So that's the line. Now, there's two shades of bars for the bar graph that goes with that. Now, the black, let's start with the black lines. The black bar, as you see from the legend, this is the prevalence in the population of hemoglobin A1C levels of a certain level. You can see, again, if we start with diabetes, so there's roughly 4 5% of the population with diabetes, according to this graph. That's what the black bar indicates. And as the hemoglobin levels decrease, you know, there's an increase of people who have those hemoglobin levels. So an increase in lower levels means people are generally healthier. The biggest graph is 5 to 5.5%. 5 .5%. Most people have hemoglobin levels there. So you're a percent and a half away from 7% in diabetes. So there's, there's quite a range there. Now the white bar is the estimated percentage contribution to excess mortality. So again, if we start with diabetes, what this is telling us is that even though there's a low prevalence in the population of diabetes, 4 or 5 percent, people who have diabetes contribute close to 25 percent of excess mortality caused or attributed to diabetes. So that corresponds with the relative risk. The risk is high of mortality if you have diabetes. Small number of people that have diabetes, high risk, high contribution to mortality. That's what we see on that column. But because the risk doesn't disappear if you don't have diabetes, there are also white bars in these other columns. And they correspond roughly to the size of the black bar and the size, the risk in the line. Right? So for the 65 to 6.9% is a very small percentage, but the risk is high. So there's probably a tripling or a quadrupling in the size of the white bar, the contribution to mortality uh, for that small population. Contrast to 5 to 5.4 percent, there's a large population who have that prevalence of hemoglobin A1C levels, but the risk is small. The line is very low, so the white bar is small. But the point is, the white bars are health status. This is what we look at diabetes in the population and the mortality contribution from diabetes in the population. If we add up just the white bars, there are more there's a higher contribution to mortality from the white bars in the 5 to 5.4, 5 to 5.5 5 to 5.9, 6 to 6.4, and 6.5 to 6.9 categories, by a lot actually, than there is from the white bar among those that are known to have diabetes. So Jeffrey Rowe summarized this idea in this quote. He said, the majority of cases occur not in the high risk, but in the center of the population distribution where large numbers of people are exposed, albeit with only small increases in risk. So, again, the idea, people that are at high risk have the disease and they have what the risk creates, you know, mortality and morbidity, they have problems. But for those that have less of a risk, those problems still exist. But because there's more of them, the sum of the problem is greater. It's, it's just the numbers thing. The sum of the problem is greater because the number is larger at the low risk population where more people are than from the high risk population where fewer people are, but the risk is greater. The same relationship and pattern was found for glaucoma and for fractures as well. You can see the same pattern in these graphs. If you walk through the same type of explanation and the same logic, the same pattern would be found. So these graphs illustrate the majority of cases in the population are not in the small numbers at high risk, or the numbers we normally consider sick or in need of intervention or care, but in the center of the population, where large numbers of people are exposed to a small risk or a small increase in risk. Therefore, efforts to prevent disease in the high-risk populations help those who most need the help. 
but from a population perspective, might have a limited impact on the health of the population. So again, this is somewhat counterintuitive. It wouldn't go over well to design a program or policy to improve population health by focusing just on the middle, where there's a low risk but a large number of people, instead of the high risk, where there's a fewer people in number. I don't think that's what the suggestion is either. So what the suggestion is is that in population health, when we consider an entire population, if we truly wish to lower population disease rates, we can't just focus on the sick beam end of the population. It's again a reminder that populations are different and unique, and that if we're thinking about a population that is interconnected, as our previous principle of the relationship between the mean and the extreme demonstrated, then from an overall health status perspective, the greater contribution to sickness and gain from health may be from where the population numbers are largest, not where the sickness is largest. This suggests again the need for thinking of a population as a whole. We can't ignore all but the sick in our efforts. Let's turn to the next idea. The causes of individual cases are not necessarily the same as the causes of disease incidence in a population. Dr. Jeffrey Rose taught that the major factors that determine why an individual gets sick are different and not necessarily the same as the factors that explain why there's so much sickness in the population. Let's consider two examples. Let's start with a graph. There's lots of graphs today. I hope you like graphs. So the first graph compares Finland and Japan, two distinct populations, and their cholesterol levels. You can see from these graphs that the range of cholesterol levels is different. What would be considered low on one end of the graph and high is different for each population. In Japan, if your blood pressure is 200, or I'm sorry, if your cholesterol level is 200, that would be considered high. Finland, high is you know, 350 to 400. 200 to 100 would be considered low. An average would be somewhere in the 275, 300 range. So while an individual living in Japan or Finland might have high blood pressure for the same reasons, you know, things in their diet or lifestyle that increase their cholesterol levels, the absolute scale and measurement of what high cholesterol levels are is different between the two populations. So the question then becomes, what is it that shifts Finland to a different position on this graph? But in Finland, what is considered low blood pressure would be equivalent to what would be considered, sorry, cholesterol levels, would be equivalent to what would be considered high in Japan. The your own suggestion is this has more to do with the characteristics of populations of their society and culture than of the individuals within the population. This quote was, primary determinants of disease are mainly economic and social, and therefore its remedies must also be economic and social. Medicine and politics cannot and should not be kept apart. Now, understanding this idea, he understood its implications. Or as somebody else said, the most important building in public health is in the hospital, is the legislature. Second graph we look at looks at violence again in two populations, comparing Chicago and England, Wales. And the specific type of violence we're looking at here is homicide. Who commits homicide? Now, this graph was used by Dr. Robert Evans from UBC in one of his talks on health inequity. So in this graph, again, if we look at individual characteristics and want to understand who commits homicide, there's some very clear characteristics of individuals. We can see that males, the blue lines, commit homicide much more frequently than females, the pink line. There's also a clear age effect. Homicide, sometime around age 15 or so, there's a clear spike, huge spike, in people who commit homicide at that age. Then it starts to drop once you're in the 25 age range, roughly, it drops for the rest of the lifespan with a slight spike at the end of life. What this graph shows us is that males are much more likely, males of a certain age are the group that commits the majority of homicides. This holds true in Chicago and in England, Wales. The lines basically overlap. The pattern is exactly the same. So we know who 
from its homicide. What these individual characteristics mask is the y-axis. If you look at the y-axis, there's an order of magnitude difference between Chicago and England Wales. Violence happens so much more frequently in Chicago than it does in England Wales. Now the causes of violence in Chicago are not a higher frequency of males of a certain age range that live there. So one must inquire into the characteristics of Chicago itself. What is it that makes the process of violence happen so much more frequently than it does in England and Wales? What these two examples help to show is the determinants of why an individual gets sick or chooses a behavior are different from the determinants of how much sickness or behavior there is in a population. And what follows from that is that a population can be studied as an entity or a system separate in behavior and function from its individual members. Let's move on to the next idea. The high-risk strategy of prevention and the population strategy of prevention. The building on the previous ideas, Dr. Jeffrey Rose articulated two strategies of prevention. The high-risk strategy, if you look at the B side of this picture, if Dr. Jeffrey Rose described this way, it's the traditional and natural medical approach to prevention. If a doctor accepts that he is responsible for an individual who is sick today, then it is a short step to accept responsibility also for the individual who may well be sick tomorrow. What the high-risk strategy seeks to achieve is something like a truncation of the risk distribution. If you look at the graph on the right, the B, you've got a, the dotted line graph. You can see the solid line graph that the risk distribution on the very tail end has, has shrunk. It's come in. It's been truncated. That's the high-risk strategy. We're focusing on people on that tail end of the distribution. How can we help them? And the outcome we're hoping for is a new curve with a tail end that isn't as far out as you can see by the solid line on the bean graph. Now, the population strategy defined by Dr. Jeffrey Rose, this is the A side of the graph, or sorry, the picture, is the attempt to control the determinants of incidence, to lower the mean levels of risk factors, to shift the whole distribution of exposure in a favorable direction. In its traditional public health form, it has involved mass environmental control methods. In its modern form, it is attempting less successfully to alter some of society's norms and behavior. So in, in the A graph, you can see the graph, the whole curve shifted. That's the population focus. It isn't just the focus on the tail end, it's the whole curve shifted. The whole population has moved to a healthier state or a healthier um, experience. That's, this leads us right into our, our last idea for today's webinar, a possible third strategy of prevention. Now, if we return to the idea of the curve, we look at the population strategy, and it's focused on shifting the whole curve, and the high risk strategy, and it's focused on the end where the cases or the sick people are, we notice something. There's a part of the graph these strategies don't explicitly pay much attention to. That's the low risk tail of the graph. The low risk tail end of the graph represents those that aren't just well, but perhaps thriving. The idea behind this possible strategy of prevention is that by paying attention to the low-risk population, to those who are really well, one can learn what is working well and spread what is already working from within a population. Now, from a theoretical perspective, this is similar to positive change philosophies and methods, such as positive deviance and positive psychology. Positive deviance, some of you may have joined our, our webinar on that earlier this year, and focuses on understanding positive outliers, and it has as its foundation, the idea that at least one person in a community working with the same resources as everyone else has already licked the problem that confounds others. The participatory change method that works within a population or system to identify what a positive outlier knows or does differently from everyone else while being on the same level playing field, i.e. they have access to the same resources. There isn't a 10,000 hour rule or uh, different economics that create a different context. And then, once you figured out why or how the outlier does what they do, designing a process to spread this information through learning by doing, not by educating people just through words alone. 
Positive deviance has been the key to transformative change on difficult and perplexing issues such as child malnutrition, female circumcision, and antibiotic-resistant bacteria. One of the keys to success for positive deviance is that it doesn't seek to introduce a foreign solution, even a best practice, to a skeptical community, but focuses on solutions already proven within a system or population, bypasses any system or cultural barriers. The solution is already owned. It just needs nourishment to grow. Positive psychology, described by Sean Acor in his fabulous TED Talk, is interested in potential. It asks questions like, or sorry, if the question is asked, how fast can a child learn how to read in a classroom, science changes the answer to how fast does the average child learn how to read in the classroom, and then we tailor the class right towards the average, according from Sean Acor here. What I posit, what positive psychology posits, is that if we study what is merely average, we will remain merely average. What I intentionally do is come into a population and say, why? Why is it that some of you are so high above the curve in terms of your intellectual ability, athletic ability, musical ability, creativity, energy levels, and your resiliency in the face of challenge? Whatever it is, what I want to do is study you, because maybe we can glean information, not just how to move people up to the average, but how we can move the entire average up in our companies and schools worldwide. He continues, if you can raise somebody's level of positivity, their brain experiences what we call happiness advantage. Is your brain at positive performs significantly better than it does at negative, neutral, or stressed? Your intelligence rises, your creativity rises, your energy levels rise. In fact, we found that every single business outcome improves. Your brain is 31% more productive at positive than at negative, neutral, or stressed. You're 37% better at sales. Doctors are 19% faster, more accurate at coming up with the correct diagnosis when positive instead of negative, neutral, or stressed. We can find a way of becoming positive in the present, and our brains work even more successfully as we're able to work harder, faster, and more intelligently. End of quote. Positive psychology seeks to find clues and understandings that can move the entire average up. Sounds like they're trying to shift the curve. And the benefits, as they described, can be large and significant. Now, what positive deviance and positive psychology demonstrate is there is growing interest in viable theories and methods developed around the idea of focusing on the positive side of things. The population health that seems intuitive on the surface, but is actually quite counterintuitive when we dig deeper into the idea. So rather than measuring mortality and morbidity, it would require measuring wellness and vitality in the same level of detail. Rather than working to fix people and prevent diseases and injuries, it requires studying the people who are not sick and not injured to find out what they know or do differently, and then finding ways to spread this information through experience in the population system. It will require adjusting how we think about sickness and health, where we now pay attention to sickness and basically ignore health because it doesn't need us. What positive population health as a potential third strategy of prevention would say to us is not only can we not ignore the healthy, we need them more than anyone else to show us what to do to improve health by shifting the population curve along towards a healthier state. While different, it seems only appropriate given what we have discussed in today's webinar about populations and that the population mean predicts the prevalence of cases. A large number of people exposed to a small risk can contribute more to the total burden of disease than a small number of people exposed to a high risk. But the causes of cases are not necessarily the same as the causes of incidence. These points showed a relationship between the normal middle and the sick tail or high risk end of the curve. What we're suggesting is that both can benefit by paying more attention to the healthiest tail of the curve and seeing what makes them different and how to apply that understanding to more effectively Shift the entire population curve towards a healthier state. We're still exploring this idea, but we hope to have some writing on the subject to be able to share with you in the coming weeks or months. I'd welcome any ideas, feedback, and suggestions on this idea. Just a reminder, my email address there on the screen. Uh, if you have any ideas, feedback, or suggestions, I'd love to hear them. So this concludes the presentation portion of our webinar today. We touched on these concepts quite briefly. Each of them on the, is worthy of a PhD dissertation in and of themselves. We hope you found this interesting and useful for your work. We now open 
up for questions and answers. Again, if you're on the phone, um, you can speak up. If you have a computer microphone, you can ask questions that way. Otherwise, um, you raise your hand. If you hover over the My Mood icon on the top and raise your hand, and then you can go ahead and type your question in the chat box, and we'll be sure to capture it, discuss it. Questions or comments, thoughts? All these are muted and may unmute themselves by pressing star six. I just unmuted everybody that was on the phone. Let's give you 30 seconds or so just to process or type your questions. What I hope is in your mind is how these ideas and concepts connect to the issues that you're working with, whatever they may be, and that they've perhaps introduced new ways of thinking about or working on or working together with others on these issues. I'm not hearing any questions or seeing any typed. Is this fine? So I would like to remind you that today's webinar was recorded. It will be up on our website shortly. Also, the, I'll be sending out a quick evaluation by email. And if you don't mind filling it in, it just helps us to improve our webinars and to make sure that they're useful and relevant to, to those that are participating in them. I also want to mention, um, if this is your first time with Equi8, we have what we call our four-hour rule. And um, Google, once upon a time, I think they still do, they had a 20% rule where they're engineers and people were free to spend 20% of their time on whatever they wished. And that autonomy and ability to innovate and be creative, uh, that's where Gmail came from. It wasn't a project that uh, management created. It was engineers and their free time that they were given uh, had the ability to, to create something new. So we've created our four-hour rule uh, in the corresponding way. And what this means is that every week we set aside at least four hours talk to people about issues they're working on and as a means of offering an opportunity for reflection and dialogue for those working in the field. We dedicated our four-hour rule to webinar follow-ups. What that means for you is that if you found this interesting or puzzling either way and wish to discuss it further, we're available for free, absolutely free, to talk by phone um, at a time that's mutually convenient you know, about this stuff. Simply email me. My email is there on the screen and we can go ahead and schedule something where we could explore this further one-on-one uh, -on -one or together with your team, however you wish. So thank you again for your participation today. Look forward to future conversations with you about Jeffrey Rose and his work, about our thinking around a possible third strategy of prevention positive population health. We look forward to seeing you in our future webinars and to seeing you in our project work around the country as well. Again, my name is Steve Peterson with Equi8, uh, signing off for today.